The potential in offshore wind globally is huge. But uh, what is the momentum in getting industrialization of offshore wind in Norway up and running? How does the future value chain in offshore wind look like? And how will offshore wind and traditional oil and gas coexist? We explore the market potential in the next talk with Astrid Skarheim Onsum, CEO of Akir Offshore Wind. Astrid Skarheim Onsum, welcome to ONS Digital and congratulations on your new role. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you've been a strong voice in promoting industrialization of offshore wind in Norway for a, for a long time. Um, could you describe the momentum that you see on that agenda right now? Yeah, we're quite excited about what we're seeing here in Norway. And uh, as you say, we've been sharing for uh, the last couple of years uh, what we've seen uh, globally and uh, trying to engage uh, the very competent Norwegian industry in the dialogue around offshore wind. And we're seeing that more and more companies are engaging and seeing the potential for transitioning their companies and uh, our industry into uh, offshore wind. So we're quite excited. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. I know there's a lot of players out there that are really eager to build this market to, to deliver into it. So, But bring over to the Arker system and the Arker group. And now you as a new CEO of, of Arker Offshore Wind. Why offshore wind uh, and why now? I think this is a, a question that reflects on uh, your initial question. It's, it is simply a factor of the market. We're seeing an, uh, a really, uh, a truly emor enormous market ahead of us globally. Uh, we're seeing that offshore wind uh, is increasingly being seen as a, a baseload uh, type of uh, energy source when you look at the renewables. And it's, of course, because of um, the regularity uh, and the capacity factors related to offshore wind. You can produce enormous amounts of uh, energy with, uh, with offshore wind. So that is, uh, that's certainly one. And then at the same time, we're seeing that the learning curve that uh, the industry has seen in shallow waters over the last 10, 15 years has driven the costs down and we're also seeing that larger turbines are improving the economics so that is uh, the underlying rationale while why we now believe in an offshore wind for the years to come interesting and, and you talk about cost reductions and kind of there's kind of been a revolution in bringing those down but what do you think is kind of from your perspective, Acker offshore wind perspective, what is the biggest um, advantage that you can bring to the market? Yeah, I, for us, it's you know, where we're getting even more excited is, is that we're now seeing that because of the learning curve that's been happening in shallow uh, water uh, wind, uh, there's now a potential to tap uh, cost effectively into deeper water wind. Uh, and that's where we really have a differentiating capability. And why should you go to uh, deep waters? Well, you know, it's simply that as you go further from shore, uh, there's a number of benefits. It's, uh, you normally see uh, a lot stronger wind when you're further from shore, so better, um, better, better uh, resource and better economics. Uh, but also there's uh, less complex with other stakeholders in the, in the ocean. So the fact that we're now seeing uh, reports that uh, say that 80% uh, of uh, the world's offshore wind resource is in waters deeper than 60 meters, that gets us excited because we really believe that uh, that, that is a, an, a foundation for the industry to grow even faster. So building on that, do you say that uh, you will from now focus mainly on the floating part or you will keep both shallow water and, and, and water floating offshore wind also in your portfolio? We're focusing on uh, deeper waters and the interesting thing for those that come from uh, offshore oil and gas is that with deeper waters, when we're talking about offshore wind, we talk about uh, waters that are deeper than 60 meters. Uh, so uh, and anything from 60 meters to the ultra deep were absolutely focused. And that means that uh, 
Sometimes uh, we will absolutely include uh, the deeper water, shallow uh, uh, and or the deeper water bottom flex solutions, as well as um, floating solutions. But floating solutions will continue to be the main focus for our company. Mm. Uh, you, you talk about technological development, but yeah. uh, but they'll also see disruption in kind of the value chain of, of offshore wind. How do you see that going forward? Will we kind of, is the same, same as oil and gas or, or, we, or can we expect something different? I think uh, you have to expect to see something different uh, because uh, the the business models in for offshore wind uh, are are just different as a na- as a factor of um, the way the uh, industry earns money and uh, also the uh, cost base of the industry. We have to think simpler because uh, this is much more a game of uh, scaling, uh, scale, simplifying technical solutions and, and mass producing them. And that's really quite different from oil and gas, which is uh, much, very much focused on optimizing one-off solutions. So while there's a lot of competence that can be transferred from the oil and gas sector, it does require a different mindset. Uh, and I certainly believe that uh, from an oil and gas perspective, um, that means that business models and delivery models will be different. Hmm. You, men- you mentioned earlier that uh, you see a huge potential globally f- for floating wind. Where w- in which direction will you point? Where do you see the greatest mo- market potential, kind of in sh- short term, medium term, uh, longer term? So Asia is certainly moving in this regard as well. Um, there's, uh, um, as we're already engaged in Korea. Um, we also see Japan coming uh, in as a, as a new uh, market that uh, will likely be um, mostly deep water just because of the geography. Um, but also other parts of, of Asia as well as North America uh, and Europe. So, so we're expecting a global market development. Uh, this all starts with um, the more developed economies. However, as the industry matures, we're also expecting to see uh, less developed uh, economies engage in offshore wind, uh, and that's exciting as well. So I think in general, you just have to, uh, the only limitation here is where the wind does not blow as uh, strongly. And that means that there is uh, a belt around uh, the equator where the winds do not have the the type of strength that we're looking for. But other than that, uh, there's a huge potential to pair offshore wind with uh, the needs uh, that the world has uh, for energy transition and uh, new energy sources. If you uh, interesting, if you go back to kind of the, the oil and gas sector and, and you look at how will offshore wind coexist with traditional oil and gas. For example, we have the Tampen project, which was was uh, uh, final. Uh, sorry, was uh, FID a couple of uh, years ago or one half year ago. Uh, could you comment on how you see this coexistence? So. Uh, it's a, it's a really interesting question, um, not the least for Norway. We certainly see that offshore wind can be a powerful way uh, to decarbonize oil and gas. Uh, however, the opportunity is, of course, only there for those markets where you have the strongest winds. Uh, the, it is possible that, again, as the industry matures, we can find solutions that also work with less wind resource. But for the moment, it's those areas that can combine high wind speed and oil and gas activity that can really leverage this opportunity. And of course, this is where we get excited about Norway because Norway has an an ambitious agenda for reducing the CO2 footprint of the Norwegian continental shelf. And at the same time, an industry with uh, all of the right competence elements to scale into offshore wind. So starting um, uh, the development of an offshore wind industry and a home market uh, in Norway, uh, it is natural to think about aligning that uh, with oil and gas uh, 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 offtake of the electricity. Also, it's exciting to think about uh, combining uh, uh, operational models and thinking about 
uh, going for the North Sea into the next uh, decades, how can we tap into the infrastructure that is already there and the facilities that are already there in order to build uh, new a new way of thinking about offshore wind in the middle of the North Sea. Uh, that's uh, something that gets uh, us excited for sure. I remember I asked you earlier this year in, in another meeting that what were on your wish list in order to get actually offshore wind working in Norway? And I think you answered uh, access to acreage mm -hmm. and you got access to acreage. Uh, Bob, but what's on your top of your wish list now? So we got access to acreage and we're really excited that uh, the Norwegian government is uh, opening up uh, two uh, areas uh, from uh, January 1st, 2021. And the next step now, I think, is uh, for uh, the industry to uh, uh, really gather and look at um, how we can use uh, the learnings from the oil and gas sector uh, with uh, respect to uh, facilitating an effective uh, industry development uh, on the basis of uh, developments in that acreage. And I think this is something that um, as uh, industry clusters around the country, uh, we need to really engage uh, with politicians and regulators to find out how we can create um, a framework for uh, this new industry that uh, happily coexists uh, with uh, the existing industries in uh, the ocean. So the next thing we are going to solve is building this framework. So I, I take note of that. And I ask you next time, what, what will be your next wish, wish list? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I read our system has delivered on oil and gas. And I want to just wish you the best of luck to also deliver on offshore wind. Thank you very much, Astrid Skarheim on Zoom, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>